Watch and technology. Black, 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 blacks and technology. Blacks and technology. Black, blacks and technology. Blacks and technology. Black, blacks and technology. Welcome, everyone, to another fantastic and exciting episode of the Bit Tech Talks, aka the Blacks and Technology Podcast. I'm your host this evening or this afternoon, wherever time zone you're in. I'm Greg Greenlee, founder of the Blacks and Tech. Technology organization, along with my incredible co-host and business dev consultant for Blacks and Technology, Ayori Selassie. Um, we are going to do a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to talk a little bit about our bid improvement survey and uh, a little bit about bit tech talks. So first thing, um, member count. We're now up to 1,058 members on the site. Uh, everybody, you know, keep supporting Blacks and Technology. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, we're Definitely shooting for 2,000 members and 10,000 members after that. Uh, so keep supporting Blacks and Technology. We're doing some great things, and um, we definitely need your support. Uh, Twitter followers, we're now over the 3,000 Twitter followers mark. Yahoo! Um, thought we actually never get there, but we did. Blacks and Technology, the network is growing. Uh, LinkedIn member count, we're at like uh, almost 1,300 LinkedIn members. So that's great as well. Um, I love, you know, to see people starting to come together, really start supporting Black and, Black and Technology and everything that we're doing. So uh, keep supporting us. Uh, about the bid improvement survey, uh, we are going through a uh, planning stage of redesigning Blacks and Technology, and we need your help. So head on over to BlacksandTechnology.net. On the front page, there is a, a, a link for our improvement survey. Tell us what you like about Blacks and Technology. There are a bunch of questions on there. Not a bunch. But there's some questions on there uh, to kind of gauge, you know, your interaction with Blacks and Technology, what you like, what you don't like. And we need this um, this input so that we can better design the new Blacks and Technology, Blacks and Technology 3.0. Uh, so, and also there's a, there's a contest attached to that. So uh, once you fill out the survey and you submit it, you're automatically entered to win one of two books. One is a Windows 2000, a Windows Server 2012 up and running book by, uh, written by one of our members, Samara Lynn. She's a, an editor at PC Mag. And the other one is UX for Lean Startups, which is a, a, a great UX book uh, for people out there to learn to user experience. So you can enter, you, you fill out the survey, you're automatically entered. We'll pick a name. Uh, I think it, sometime in December, we're going to do this. We're going to do the drawing and then we'll notify whoever won and you'll have your pick of one of those two books. I think there could be a problem. I think we're going to have like maybe three winners. So everybody has a good shot. Um, Next thing, Big Tech Talk. Uh, use if you are listening to this podcast, use uh, the hashtag Big Tech Talk. Let us know what you think about the podcast, what you think can be improved upon, um, and you know if you have any questions or anything, uh, use those hashtags to send us some questions. Or if you have any ideas for uh, the Big Tech Talks, let us know using the hashtag Big Tech Talk. Right now, we're on the road towards recording our 50th podcast. This is actually podcast number 56, and we have four more to go till we reach 50, which is a pretty great, great milestone. Uh, so in conjunction uh, with that, we are um, in conjunction with an NPR um, promotion or event that's happening. Um, NPR is, is doing an event as well. We're going to let Ayori tell us a little bit about this NPR hashtag campaign. Awesome. So thank you, Greg. So uh, NPR has been um, uh, started a discussion back in November, um, either November or October, about African American African Americans in technology. Um, and starting on December second until December twentieth, they will be continuing that conversation about African Americans in technology via Twitter through a social media campaign called. Hashtag NPR Blacks in Tech, 
for every day between December 2nd and December 20th, there will be two African Americans in technology tweeting a day in the life. So follow that hashtag and engage in those uh, Twitter conversations. We'll be taking questions from uh, different people throughout uh, who have interest in technology, and hopefully we'll be having some really groundbreaking uh, discoveries there. Um, and also, as, as Greg mentioned, this is our uh, first podcast in a series leading up to our 50th podcast where we'll be taking a deep dive into the topics around uh, the perception, the participation, and visibility of African Americans in technology. So we hope you will join us for this uh, podcast and um, the following up to our 50th podcast. This is really exciting, and we're really glad that you all are joining us. Definitely, definitely. And for tonight's podcast, for our 46th podcast, we have our guest, Maurice Cherry, uh, on the show. So Maurice is the founder of Revision Path. Uh, He's a developer and a designer. And uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce Maurice. Maurice, thanks for having, uh, or thanks for taking time out and to join us on the show. Um, Go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and about Revision Path. Okay. Uh, Well, like you my name is Maurice Cherry. I uh, started Revision Path in February of 2013, and uh, my, my purpose for starting it was to be a showcase for black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers because I felt that the general reporting in the sort of tech and design community really seemed to neglect those people. And I don't know if that's purposeful or not, but certainly I didn't see it. And I, you know, go to conferences and network with people. And so instead of really lamenting the situation and trying to sort of strike back at conferences and websites and wonder why they don't feature diversity, I figured it would be easier if I just made a showcase, talked to a bunch of people, and just took it from there. I, and I definitely commend you on uh, – on, uh, founding revision path because I always I talk to a lot of people and I always say that you know the internet is the biggest media outlet there is and we need more content out there to increase our visibility which is one of the pillars of uh, of blacks and technology so definitely commend you for starting revision path and that's revisionpath.com r e v i s i o n path Dot com. So get, give us a little bit about your background and how you got started as a developer and designer. Okay. Um, well, my background is a little, <laughs> I guess you could say it's a little unorthodox. Um, I started, I guess, really being interested in computers when I was, when I was younger. My mom uh, gave me a hand-me-down Laser 50 computer that my older brother had. and uh, It was using that that I learned, uh, or really I kind of taught myself, uh, basic, and this was maybe in like first or second grade. So sort of just programming with basic, doing little simple, you know, simple programs and subroutines and things like that. And so I started learning basic and sort of went with that through, uh, I'd say maybe through about sixth or seventh grade. Kind of didn't really do much after that. I actually went more into writing. I was writing a lot in middle school and writing a lot in uh, in high school. But also in high school, that's when I started taking up uh, HTML. I had just a basic GeoCities page, and I would pull up websites and kind of reverse engineer how they built everything. Because, I mean, this was like 95, 96. So there weren't any uh, websites uh, or books that really described, you know, like, how to build a website, how to do this. Everything is sort of like the wild, wild west. It was just a unmapped frontier. Um, and then I went to school. I went to Morehouse College. I went there, started in computer science, and engineering because I wanted to be like Dwayne Wayne from uh, <laughs> a different world. And, uh, and, I, and after my first semester, I switched because I went to my my um, my advisor and said, oh, yeah, you know, I, I really like what we're doing and learning C++, but I really want to do stuff with the web. Like, is there any way that we're learning anything about web applications or anything like that? And he's like, no, you should just switch your major. And so I switched my major to math. Um, so my, my undergrad degree is in math. After that, I did a bunch of different web jobs, uh, AT&T, WebMD, Autotrader.com. Uh, did a lot of different sort of startup type things. When I was actually at Morehouse, I interned 
for NASA for two summers. So I did, I did a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, in 2008, I, I left AT&T and started my own design firm, now 318 Media, which uh, just turned five earlier this week. So that's been a really just sort of big thing that I've been doing here, which is providing design services for politicians and nonprofits and small businesses, individuals. So my, my whole background has been really kind of kind of buried. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. That's that's was Dwayne Wayne, was he a was he a comp sci? Person? No, he was uh, he was doing well. He was doing engineering because see, it's funny because they sort of never up in the show. But I don't. I think he started off with math, like around season two, because his whole pickup line was that he made a sixteen hundred on his SATs or something like that. I think that was like his pickup line. And then he did, you know, <laughs> like programming stuff with Kanishiwa Electronics. And then he did that for like a summer or two, and then he came back and was teaching math at uh, Hillman. So it's, I, it's funny because I, I went to, I did that same thing, but I started out in computers and then like switched over to math. So, Interesting. so why, did, I why didn't I ever pick up on that? I never, I never <laughs> remember. <laughs> just... Anyone who's not able to follow this conversation. <laughs> it's I'm a, I'm a, get... Yeah. So, so, so this is about Dwayne Wayne was a character in the television show, a different world. And um, I I remember that. I remember being a little kid watching that television show and seeing him, you know, and of course, you know, with with this being an African-American, a show with African-Americans, it was like we watched it every week when it came on with my, like with my whole family. And that one episode when he like created that video game and like everything blew up and his career changed and he had all these Changes happening in his life with his wife and everything. Yeah, that was like right near the end of the. That was like right near the end of the last season. He made that uh, game called Grammar Boy. Yeah, Grammar Boy. Too too cute. (laughs) Why don't Why don't I remember? I'm about to get my like geek card revoked here. I totally I totally don't remember that at all. Maybe I was just more into the jokes of uh, of the show than I was what they were actually. (laughs) No, that's all. Because I had to do that. Oh man, yeah, I have to go back. I have to go back now. It's funny that you mentioned go to. I mean, that you mentioned subroutines and everything like that because I remember go to statements, go sub statements. <laughs> now they're oh yeah, now. oh yeah. I was I was learning that because I I remember we went to our 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 local public library and we had this it was a big green book on my like, teaching yourself basic and I remember I, I could only do so much on my little computer and then <laughs> I went to school and I think it was right around first or second grade was when we started being introduced to the Apple IIe and then saw how that could run basic uh. and so I started doing like programming stuff in my gifted courses like in second third grade with that big green basic book so if I can find that book again I'm so getting it I don't even remember what it's called, but if I can find it, that's going to be like a collector's item. I see Commodore 64s all the time on uh, on Craigslist. People are always getting rid of them. <laughs> I saw a Laser 50 on eBay, but I, it was too late for me to buy it. But I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open for it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, um, so Maurice, I'm interested in... Um, Sort of your per, your perception of uh, of, of African Americans uh, in technology, and so we talk about these these designers, and we t- I think we talk a little bit about developers and code. So I wonder, do you feel like there are more African American designers than you know uh, coders? Or sort of uh, do you see any kind of difference between the two? Are they one and the same? What do you think? Well, I feel like, I mean, designers and developers in sort of the way the current web is, those lines are really blurring because there's so much of development that crosses into design, and there's a fair amount of design that crosses over into development. So it's sort of like a Venn diagram where there there is some overlap between the two. Generally, when people think of designers, uh, designers are more creative So they're, you know, looking at things with, like, typography and the usability and user interface design and trying to figure out the psychology behind a particular thing, whereas web developers tend to be more technical in nature. 
so they're focusing on like problem solving skills. They can code in a number of different uh, languages, whether it's HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, Python, what have you. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there between the two. Um, saying that there's more one than the other is uh, it's it's kind of hard to say that only because I think that uh, I, I just think that there's a lot of overlap between the two. I know that with people that we talk to for revision path, I think we probably talk to more designers. Uh, but there are, I mean, there's a fair amount of developers out there, and there are even developers that will sort of vary on what is considered development. They might not think that programming in HTML and CSS is, de- is exactly web development. They might think that is more web design. So there's always that little kind of overlap, I think, between the two, uh, the two fields. Okay, yeah, I, I love that Venn diagram. I'm going to have to ask you to work with us uh, to produce <laughs> that Venn diagram and more because I remember when I was doing quality engineering back in the day, um, and quality, quality engineering was very much manual testing. And nowadays, quality engineers uh, are also expected to code uh, with automated testing. So that whole kind of... Uh, perspective of, of folks who work in quality and developers or programmers are blurring as well. So there's a nice little Venn diagram there. Right. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, Mari, tell me, where, where does some of the inspiration for designers come from? Like, And, and I, I, I ask this because I'm seeing before before Blacks and technology was, you know, redesigned a couple of times. I had like no clue as to um, into the world of of web design, right? Like I knew about web design, but I didn't. I, I had no clue as to how much goes into actually designing websites, just from you know from an aesthetic point of view, uh, until. Uh, one of my one of my friends, Ravel, was you know showing me all these mind blowing sites. Like, hey, you know, you want to you want to see some real good stuff? Take a look at this, and then you'll see why this site looks way better than this one. He was you know telling me about fonts and all this stuff, and I'm like, wow, really? This is like a science. So, uh, tell me, what, what do you what is where do you get some of your inspiration? Where does some of the inspiration come from? Uh, for me personally, or just I guess like designers in general. Well, for you and in in general. Okay, well, I mean, for me, uh, I tend to be, I'm inspired a lot by music. Um, I tend to do a lot of more uh, thematic type design. I have to get into a certain mind space to to really get to a certain sort of design point. So, for example, I really like mid-century modern type typography and design, you know, think like uh, Saul Bass or, or things like that, uh, which is like right around the 50s, 60s. He did a lot of title cards for Otto Preminger and Alfred Hitchcock, uh, stuff like that. Um, wow. So for me, like with mu- music gets me in a particular mindset uh, when I'm designing. So if I need to design something that's more gritty, I might listen to like, MF Doom or Wu Tang or you know something like that. If I need something that's more like mid-century modern, like I was describing before, I'll listen to uh, like Benny Goodman or some big band stuff. If I need something that's more in a '70s-ish kind of thing, I'll listen to you know James Brown or the OJ. So like for me, it's music. Music gets me in the right sort of you know mental mindset to then think, okay look at fonts, look at colors, look at things like this. Um, and then when I'm in that mindset, and I would extend this, I think, to designers in general, there's a fair amount of research that goes into it. I think a lot of people have the, the notion that designers sort of dream up concepts. And there are some that do, but there's also a fair amount of us that have to do research if it's for something that we're not totally familiar with. So there's a lot of research that's looking into, you know, specific design at the time, colors that were used, fonts that were used, uh, sayings and slogans, and there's a lot of, of research that has to go into. I would say any designer that doesn't do their research if they're, they're really trying to nail a particular theme is probably reinventing the wheel because there's a lot of stuff out that's already been done that you're trying to do. Um, there's, there's sort of that notion that looks like good artists 
uh, copy Great Artist Steel or something like that. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot out there that's already been done that you can sort of grab inspiration from. Uh, and mm-hmm. using research, I think, is a good way to get a lot of of, uh, of information about that, whether it's just design theory or color theory or, or anything. Just getting that research helps you to, to have a body of knowledge to pull from that you can use to help create, you know, bigger and better things. Yeah, nice. I, I, uh, that's awesome because I actually read this book uh, by a, a woman named uh, Laura Klein, um, UX for Lean Startups, and I saw one of her presentations, and she talked about sort of rapid prototyping uh, and and sort of the, the the value of that in UX and in uh, and in app design. And she uh, one of the things she encouraged people to do is using, um, you know, your uh, Chrome or your Firefox, you know, plugins, you can go to a website that you really like and you can just go in and do, use the uh use the um the inspector, use the design inspector um and you can modify the code in the in within the web browser and you can copy the code within the web browser and you can pull it in and and do other things with it. And so she really encouraged that. And I was like, you know, duh, like why why try and do it all from the start? Like as you said, you know, don't don't redesign the wheel, right? Yeah, it's so much. It's like leaps and bounds easier now. And I tell this to anyone that that is getting into design, it's so much easier now for designers and developers that are trying to get into this field and learn. Because there are a plethora of resources. There's tons of books. There's people out there that are willing to help you. Like this, like 20 years ago. None of this really was here. Like 1993 was like the, you know, there was nothing really. The web really didn't start kicking off until like the mid 90s. So, I mean, just think about how young this field is and how much has happened within such a short amount of time, you know. Yeah. Have you ever, um, have you ever had any any of your designs uh, jacked? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's, I think it is. <laughs> I would say it's probably. I wouldn't say it. Well, let me not say it's par for the course, but I have had that happen. Um, but it's. I don't really. I don't mind it. I guess it depends on how they're using it. Like if they're using it to make money, I might have a, an issue with that. But um, it's happened. It's happened in the past mostly. Uh, probably not so much now, but it's happened in the past. Okay, so you're you're pretty cool about it. You're not. You, you know. You don't flip out about it. that's that's good here. I mean, like, I'll reach out. Like, if I see something that's being used in a particular way, of course, I'll reach out and see. I'm not going to, you know, just completely fly off the handle because nine times out of ten, the person may not have even known they could have gotten in touch with me or something like that. Like, it's that saying about how you, you, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar or something like that. You know, I, I understand people that do sort of fly off the handle when there's the slightest accusation of online theft. I get that, uh, but it's also important to remember that anything you're doing, it's probably been done before somewhere in okay. some fashion. Uh, so try not to, you know, get too mad about it. You know, okay. try. I, one one piece of advice that I got early on with design is that you have to be prepared to kill everything that you make. Everything that you make, you have to be prepared to, like, eviscerate it, to slaughter it. And the sooner that you embrace that, the sooner, the better your work gets, right? Mm-hmm. When you realize your work is not good enough, kill it. Start again. Do something else. Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah. probably the, the, easy, the best advice that I've gotten early on about design. Like, you have to be prepared to just kill anything that you make. Like, don't hold on to something too much because then you'll start to not see it objectively. Uh, you'll see it subjectively. You know, there's always room for improvement. I look at that even with revision paths. Like, there's tons of ways I can improve, and then one day I'll get around to that. But uh, right now, I'm not, you know, I'm not sweating it. So, yeah. That's funny that you mentioned that. I, that there was actually a uh, a, 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 a music kind of thing going on. This was some years ago. You remember when, when, when uh, Timbaland, the producer, uh, first came out and he was just blowing away everybody, all the competition and everything like that. Everybody wanted a track from Timbaland, right? And mm-hmm. uh but then you had a bunch of people 
you know, pretty much copying his style, you know, the way he did his drums or whatever. Right. And um, he, you know, he, he, uh, he got upset about that. He didn't see it as flattery or anything like that. He really got upset about it. And I think there was, he, he had mentioned this in an interview. He was talking to, um, I think he was actually talking to Prince and he Mm -hmm. had mentioned it to Prince, how upset he was about it. And Prince just told him flat out, like, don't get upset. You know, like you're, you're, you're too good to be upset about this. Do, do, just do something and do it better. Yeah. And you can't, it's, it's, it was just funny. Cause like when I started revision path, for example, there were other people that were telling me like, well, someone else is doing this. There's another site that does the same thing. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'll be another voice to that chorus instead of trying to be, yeah. you know, like Beyonce, you know? Gotcha. Nice. Cool. So I have another question. So this is sort of a, a, a little bit more um, uh, theoretical. <laughs> okay. So we talk a lot about the perception of African-Americans in technology uh, on this podcast. And so I'm really interested, as from the perspective of a designer, if you were to redesign, redesign the perception of African-Americans in, tech, in technology, what would it look like? How, like, how would you redesign it? How would I redesign the perception? Hmm. Well, I think that uh, redesign the perception. There would certainly be uh, more democratization, I think, across the field of just like technology and design in general. Um, A lot of what we see is the public face of technology is like Silicon Valley with design is sort of along that those same lines of design based startups and things like that. And, you know, if, if you want that to be your goal, like I want to get to Silicon Valley, I want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, like, Hey, that's great. You know, do I think that needs to be the end goal for everyone? Absolutely not. Like whatever your definition of success is strive for that. Your definition of success may not be, I want to get to Silicon Valley and start a company and be bought out and have millions of dollars. Like, that may not be what you want to do. You may want to have a comfortable living where you make $6,000 a month and are able to travel four times a year, and that's success to you. And if that's what it is, that's what it is. Uh, But in terms of the perception of, of, I guess, people of color in technology, particularly with black people, uh, I would like to see us more confident and more visible. I'm not saying that we're not visible because we're certainly, you know, in in any number of uh, positions, whether it's designers or if it's network type stuff or anything like that. I mean, I teach also, I teach design to business students. Uh, So I know that there are people that are interested in this that look like me that are coming up. So it's not a, a huge shock or it shouldn't be a huge shock to anyone that there are people of color that are in this field. Uh, the visibility is something that people might not see because the visible face of, you know, technology is at these conferences and these, you know, startups and things like that. Well, there are pretty much no people of color, but that's more based on how the media is covering it. I feel, I feel of course the media wants to look for those success stories, that kind of thing. And with those success stories comes a certain level of validation from other media outlets, which is why these are the stories that you see. And I think that, you know, that's kind of part for the course of any kind of news, right? You know, they focus on, on just specific types of things, like if it, if it bleeds, it leads, that kind of thing. But speaking more so on, on confidence, when I interview people for Revision Path, and even before Revision Path, and I would talk to other uh, designers and developers and things like that, uh, there seems to have been a tacit lack of confidence regarding their abilities. Like, yes, this is what they do for a living. Yes, this is how they, you know, make money. This is the title on their business card. But they don't really want to talk about it. They don't really want to say, this is what I do. There's, there's sort of a sheepishness that comes with, you know, standing up and saying, well, yes, I'm a designer and I'm going to talk about this. Or I'm a developer and I'm going to talk about wow. this. Uh, which I can see a little bit where that comes from. And and I'll just give a personal example here. When I worked for the state of Georgia back in, <laughs> back in 2005, um, 
I wanted to attend South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. Once I was in South by Southwest, it was, I think, one of the first interactive festival years, and I wanted to go, and, and uh, I was sort of telling my boss about it, and, you know, she was like, no, you know, I don't, I don't think you should go because you're going to, you know, how is, how is you going to South by Southwest going to, to represent the company, and it's going to cost this much, and blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. I think depending on whatever your job might be, there could be some level of pushback from your employer when you're trying to, like, speak up and speak out and make a name for yourself within whatever your position is. They might try to keep you down or hold you down in some sort of way. Uh, and I know people that have, like, you know, work, like they, they might be doing a side project, but they'll say, oh, I also work for this, you know, particular employer. And they've gotten reprimanded for it or they've gotten fired for it or something like that. So I think that there could be that level of, uh, what's the word, fear, I guess. Mm-hmm. behind working somewhere and then saying, oh, I'm going to speak up about what I know because what they happen is your company might not support you in that way, which I think is a lot different from when we see non-blacks in tech, I should say, doing that same thing. Uh, so I, it's, you know, and I, I don't know if that's really just an overarching reason. I know that's one reason that I've seen, but I think there's certainly kind of a lack of confidence when it comes around to really saying, this is what I do, this is, you know, this is the work that I do, I'm going to speak up, I'm going to show what I do in this particular uh, type of fashion. It tends to be very insular. Like, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm going to stay in this little bubble, and I'm not really going to try to talk about it or say anything about it or stand up and say, I am, you know, a designer, I am a developer, in a way that could make you more visible. Yeah, I think uh, I, really, I just see that a lot. Really, I see that a lot. Yeah, I think you really hit on something um, really hot right there because, um, I mean, if you take the sports analogy, right, and you've got your basketball player and when he runs, he takes the ball down the court and he just slams it in and he is just, uh, super emphatic and excited and then the football player and he makes that touchdown and then he's dancing and he gets the technical file for the dancing and all that stuff. Um, even in that field where we really dominate and we really, you know, have shown that, you know, we, we are really uh, the greatest players in the world in that particular field of sports, there is still um, a lot of negative sort of um, visibility that comes with being that visible, um, a lot of negativity that comes with being that visible. And I do think Mm -hmm. that people tend to take that fear into their careers in in high tech that says, well, I'm already African-American. I already stand out. Um, Maybe I'm not going to um, make a more attention by by speaking at this conference, by, by, by trying to do this keynote, by being very visible, because there is some, uh, some degree of, of, of um, uh, risk that comes with that. Absolutely. There, there's, there's certainly uh, a degree of risk when you're making yourself that visible. And, I mean, this is, for me, it's not something that's, that's new. Uh, in 2005, when I started the Black Weblog Awards, I was getting all sorts of hate mail and, oh, this is racist. Uh, and, I mean, I get that even now about Revision Path. I'll just say, oh, Revision Path is a showcase for black web designers, graphic designers, and web developers. Well, don't you think that's racist? No. I don't think it's racist at all. And I'll just leave the conversation at that because, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to be equipped to give a conversation about that. But more importantly, you know, the industry has had – years, decades, really, in terms of becoming more diverse. There's always all this talk about, oh, we need to take baby steps. We need to take baby steps to start introducing more women into this field. We need to take baby steps to start reaching out to black communities and what have you. It's 2013. There needs to be, like, moon man-sized jumps yeah. to make this happen. The, the time for baby steps is, is over, you know. Like, Jim Crow is over, Reconstruction yeah. is over. We don't need to make baby steps anymore. We should be mm-hmm. making huge leaps. And so when people of color start making their own spaces and recognizing themselves, 
then you have, you know, kind of the mainstream industry that sort of pops off. It's like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. This is racist. Why can't it be? Why can't it be all girls code? Why does it have to be black girls code? Like, what is that about? It's showcasing young black girls. You're teaching young black girls how to code. How is that a bad thing? How is that bad? I agree. I think I think we definitely need to see a surge of of women in technology and of minorities in technology. And I think that this is a very critical time to have that surge occur because it's going to affect the later generations. So what we're doing right now is we're putting these people in positions of leadership in highly visible positions so that these younger generations will benefit from seeing them as role models and that will in, uh, that will serve to further feed the pipeline that um, – and, and we keep calling it a pipeline problem. Well, let's fix the pipeline line problem right now by creating a surge with the people we have in the industry now. Right. Definitely. You can't be what you don't see. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And speaking of, you know, fixing the pipeline uh, and having, uh, you know, people to look up to, who, who did you – who did you look up to? Who inspires you? Uh, and who? Uh, <laughs> who? Who? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> who are some of my mentors? Yeah. So <laughs> this is the same question that I ask people, and I hate that I'm going to give the same answer, but <laughs> <laughs> I did not have any mentors growing up when I was getting into technology and things like. Well, no, let me take that back. Let me take that back. If there was anyone that has really helped me sort of get where I am that has sacrificed, it would have to be my mother. Like, hands down, uh, she taught at a community college, and when she taught and worked, I was able to be in the computer lab while she was working. So this might have been after I got out of uh, school, you know, like high school. Like, after I got out for the day, I could come over to the college and work in the computer lab for hours learning programming and stuff like that, you know. And I know that she's made just countless sacrifices for me, you know, because I'm her son, duh. But, you know, she's made mm-hmm. countless sacrifices to help me get where I am. Outside of that, I could not, and I'm being, I'm being completely honest, I could not tell you anyone that has been like an, an active sort of mentoring type of force that has been like, I'm going to show you these opportunities and give you the, I can't. I can't. And I hate to give that answer because I ask people with revision path the same thing. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know. You know, I just kind of just fell into it. And, you know, likewise, I kind of just fell into doing what I'm doing and I've kind of paid my own way. And it sounds narcissistic, but I have reached out to mentors before. Like I've reached out to people and say, oh, you know, do you mentor people? Could you be my mentor? And you know, the response is usually, oh, think about it. Oh, I don't know if I'm a good mentor. Oh, it's going to cost this much to mentor you, that kind of thing, which I, no one has time for that, you know. I mean, if you're going to mentor, you should do it, I think, freely. You shouldn't be looking to get a financial transaction out of it if you're trying to do it. I mean, that's coaching, and I'm not looking for a coach. So personally, I haven't. Aside from my mother, I really can't look at anyone in the industry and be like, oh, this person, you know, helped me all these steps of the way. And did. now I've certainly done partnerships with people. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't include that as mentorship. I'd include that as partnerships because these were things that I sort of kind of forced my own way out. But in terms of like mentorship, like I'm going to put you in front of this person that's going to help you, or I'm going to buy you this book that's going to show you what you need to do. Uh uh-uh. Yeah. Trial and error. Trial and error. So, so then, um, are you, is there anyone that you're mentoring now? Do you have room for for mentees? <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone, someone emailed me today, and I don't even know if it's, if this is mentoring, but I mean, people email me and ask questions all the time, and I'm usually, depending on what my schedule is, I'm usually very free to give knowledge about, you know, stuff like this particular guy is a freelancer in New Jersey, I think a freelance designer. And he's like, you know, I'm looking to find more leads because I'm trying to get more work and I'm looking around locally and can't, can't really find anything. And so I, you know, just sent him an email and was like, you know, don't think locally, you know, just try to branch out because the web is everywhere. Uh, You know, think about registering as a vendor for your city 
Think about registering as a vendor for the state. Uh, there's plenty of job boards. You can look at this website that has job postings, like just stuff like that. I mean, but in terms of like active mentoring, uh, not right now. I'm open to it, though. I'm certainly open to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so that's so interesting. I, I, one, I really appreciate that you're paying it forward, um, and 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 I would say that you definitely are mentoring in many ways because e- even just the revision tab site and having this list of people, and you've done work for this, and you know that's not your job. You know, you've really gone out and and taken a step beyond to sort of further populate and add clarity to the the industry of design and um, people whom uh, people in our demographic can relate to. And I just really applaud you for that. So, I mean, when, when Greg told me about you, because I, I didn't know that you were out there, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I, I can't <laughs> wait. To- Oh, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I mean, Revision Path is so, I mean, Revision Path is something that I wanted to do for for a long time. Really, I think since about maybe 2006, 2007, I wanted to do this, but I didn't really have the time to do it because I was working a full-time job and I had the Black Web Blog Award and I was in grad school at the time, too. But I didn't have time to, like, pull all this stuff together. And But now it was, you know... Um, my business was doing good. I said, you know what? This is the time for me to to do it because I've got the resources and the and the I've got the bandwidth, I guess, so to speak, to do this. So I figure, you know, let me just put it out there, see what happens. I knew the first version wasn't going to be great, which is <laughs> kind of what's up now. I knew it wasn't going to be great, but I was like, it's got to be something. Like I've got to start. Like I think that's important. A lot of us, when it comes to things like this, and that's whether and this is just a general like overall life lesson, right? Whether you're learning to design or to code or you're starting a project or whatever, the first version is going to be terrible. Like the first version is going to suck. Like don't try to make the first version perfect. Just do the first version. Yeah. Like just step out there and do it so you can improve and iterate. Like don't worry that you've got to, you know, and I sort of did that too, right? Like I, I waited for like six years before I got my ducks in a row to say, I'm going to do a revision path. Well, I could have just started it. And I, I did eventually. I just said, let me just go ahead and do it and yeah. start it. And, you know, here it is now. I love it. Great. Yeah. I, I don't even want to go back and listen to uh, the first episode of Blacks and Technology podcast. It's probably horrible. Oh, oh the first, the first, it. yeah, the first yeah. podcast, the first podcast that I did. It was funny because um, uh, someone that interviewed me. She was in town, and she's like, "Oh, I heard about Revision Path. I was wondering if we could do lunch and do an interview." And I was like, "Great!" I didn't have an external. I still don't have an external mic. I didn't have an external mic or anything. Like we recorded it on my phone in like a somewhat noisy restaurant and I tried to clean it up as much as I could in audacity. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens. And since then it's gotten better because I've refined my process, but you know, at first you just gotta, you just gotta put it out there. You gotta do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first time I did, um, I did a Blacks and Technology podcast. I think I scripted it so much that it just, it was just, uh, it, was t- it was terrible. I yeah. haven't even listened to it since I first did it, but I hate listening to myself. <laughs> Once I record something, I don't go, I usually don't go back and listen to it because I'm, I'm always like, ah, uh, I'm all, you know, you know how they say you're, you're your own worst critic. And I know if I listen to it, I just like, oh my God, that was, uh, but I kind of take <laughs> note, mental notes as I'm doing it. And I'm like, oh, I gotta, I have to change this. Or I have to do this. So, but over, you know, over time you become more relaxed with it. You become uh, more relaxed with the questions and your introduction, everything like that. And everything gets more refined. And the next thing you know, you have a, a much better product. So. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, uh, let me ask you what, what, what are three things that you think that every designer or developer should know? Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, no, I don't want to reiterate the thing that I said earlier about, you know, kind of kill your work, but I think that's important. I'm not going to include that in the first one. Uh, the first thing I think is that you need to learn how to write. 
And it probably sounds weird. It's like you're a designer, you're a developer. Why do I need to know how to, to write? Because whether you're designing or whether you're developing, you still have to be an effective communicator. Um, you know, you have to think through, whether, I mean, say it's development, you're a problem solver. So you have to think through the entire experience, think about what words you're going to use for different error states and things like that. You have to choose that stuff carefully. And if you're a designer, that's the same way. If you're researching a particular, uh, you know, genre or a particular time frame, you've got to be able to know kind of what you're looking for, how to communicate that, that sort of thing. And not necessarily in like an academic, you know, collegial kind of way, you know, just learn how to write. And really, uh, there's a saying that writing is rewriting. So really, the best way yeah. that you learn how to write is to keep writing and just keep writing and keep writing and keep writing and reading because reading and writing kind of fall right into play. So the first thing I would say is learn how to write because that helps you become a more effective communicator, which then trickles down into whatever your specific work is, whether it's uh, design or whether it's development. Uh, the second thing, and I think this also uh, relates to both design and development, particularly design on the web, is learning some basics about user experience. Uh, just learning about how do users use the web, so to speak. Like how do people, if, they're, if you're making a web page, are they reading it in an F reading pattern or are they reading it in a Z reading pattern? Uh, are your elements spaced far enough for people to read? Is your line length too long? You know, what do your error states look like? What do your buttons look like? That kind of thing. So getting the user experience helps on the design and the development end. On the development end, it helps so you basically don't have to do the work twice. And it helps on the design end so you're not just creating some abstract thing that no one knows how to use. You're actually doing something that's usable because designers and developers, I think, both are problem solvers, and you don't want to create a problem with the work that you're doing. So learning user experience helps you to sort of obfuscate, or not obfuscate, helps to clear up that obfuscation. Uh, there's, a, there's a good book, uh, I think the book is by Seth, no, not Seth, but it's by Steve Krug, called Don't Make Me Think, which is about web usability. I think that's a good book for anyone that's looking to, to get into learning more about just user experience in general. Um, and what else for designers and developers? I would say just keep learning. Uh, like I sort of said before, this is a relatively young field. This field is only about 20-something years old. Um, it certainly doesn't have the, the longevity that a lot of other fields have. Uh, so you have to keep learning because things are changing every day. Like there's things that are going on now that just two or three years ago were not very commonplace with both design and development. There's new languages, there's new IDEs, there's new trends. Like you always have to sort of keep learning and keep staying sharp, work on side projects, go to bookstores and look at the design sections, go to meetups, you know, keep your skills sharp and just keep learning. Mm. So just sort of as a, as a follow-up on that one about sort of keeping your skills sharp, this one is probably more for people who might be in school right now studying design. But when I was okay. in, I was in school, um, and I did actually uh, uh, attempt to study computer science, but uh, in, in the end, in the long run, I learned that I learned more in the field. Um, but I, I would get frustrated in class. I would get frustrated with my instructors because they were really outdated and they really didn't know what was happening in the real world. So I, I had a, a context of the real world, and I knew I wasn't learning the things that would make me more valuable out there. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for students that might feel like they're in that same position? That might feel like they're in school and the things that they're learning are not what they should be learning? Yeah, yeah, that, that they're not learning the latest and greatest technologies. I mean, let me give you an example. When I was in school, I took a, a class uh, around design, and they taught me typesetting. They taught me mm -hmm. typesetting from the perspective of bound books <laughs> rather than typography or how to design. 
font mm-hmm. or typeset. Um, and so it was just completely archaic and, and uh, useless, you know, for me and useless for, for the industry that I was working in. Um, and I think at that time, if I had had maybe like some mentors, you know, someone like you to talk to, to talk through that with, it probably would have helped me. So I'm wondering what advice might you have for folks who might be in that uh, situation today? Okay. I'll just say, first of all, I'd like, I'd love to learn about typography. Like I'm a huge font nerd. Like I would love to learn all of that. I just want to learn it on my own, like studying and stuff. But I find all that kind of stuff fascinating personally, because I'm a designer. I like that. But um, so, so you're in school and you think that the stuff that you're learning is pedantic and not what is going to further you in the field, which I totally get that. Um, couple of things you can do. First thing I would say is if you happen to be a member of AIGA, A-I-G-A, the, I think it's American Institute for Graphic Arts, go to AIGA meetups and talk to working professionals in the field that can tell you, like, this is the stuff that you need to know. I know here in Atlanta, the Atlanta chapter, uh, they have, I think, about one or two events every month, and it's usually small meetups of about 15 or 20 people, but they talk about like clients and design and, and, you know, these are things you need to know and stuff like that because, you know, I teach at a college and I can tell you I had to fight tooth and nail in 2013 to get them to not teach how to create web layouts using tables. So I completely understand, like, (laughs) being in school and feeling like the stuff you're learning is just not working for you. Um, so you have to go out and talk to people that are working in the field, and a good way with that is like Iga Meetups. Uh, meetup.com also has several different design meetups. If you're in any major metropolitan city, chances are there are going to be uh, design meetups. And I would say if you go and you find that you're the only person of color there that is common, that is just the way that this industry is, you will probably be the only person of color there. But don't let that deter you from not coming back because the more that you come back and you sort of establish yourself as being uh, a regular there and people remember your face, go up, talk to people, introduce yourself, get some business cards made. Even if you have just like a little basic website and your phone number, like get, I can't stress, well, not necessarily, but I think it's important to get cards made. I'll give you an example why I was at a recent Adobe event about a week or two ago and you know, it was Adobe had come into town. It was like Terry White, like the famous Terry White and a whole bunch of other people that were just debuting all the stuff that's going on with Adobe Creative Cloud and this kind of thing. I call it Adobe's apology tour because they had that big breach where they like 152 million user passwords <laughs> got okay. taken. And I was like, oh, this is their apology tour. Um, but they were there and they had like networking things. And so I was talking to people there just about revision path. And I, I tell you, I talked about 40 people. I walked away with one business card. The only person I remember is the person who gave me their cards. I don't remember anyone else's name or where they worked. I couldn't tell you. And it's not because I have a bad memory. It's because nobody had anything that I could walk away with and say, oh, I know who you are. I remember you. I think a business card is important. Even if it's, you know, don't go to Vistaprint. Like, don't get a Vistaprint card. But do something from, like, Moo or or I think Moo is, is really good. Those little, they have these little kind of, like, almost like a stick of chewing gum type business cards that I use those, and they tend to be good uh, conversation starters. So I would recommend that. Uh, but definitely meetups. Meetups where you're talking to people that not only live in your city but also work in your field, that's going to be the way – that you're going to find out the stuff that you need to know. Like you have to educate yourself on what you need to know. And not only that, but look at, excuse me, look at blogs, read, read blogs about design, read blogs about development. Uh, There are tons of them out there. Um, Some good ones for designers, for example, might be CSS tricks or smashing magazine. Uh, Developers might be right along that same line, maybe hacker news might be a good one. Uh, Designer News is also good for designers. Uh, And it just gives you an idea of what are people in the industry talking about, uh, what's popular. And these are things that you can then turn around and use in meetups to sort of introduce yourself to people or or starting off point, you know, 
for conversation. Like, don't go in just empty handed, like, oh, I'm just, you know, pro black me with my business cards and I don't know what to say. No, 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 no. You got, it's the whole, um, I don't know if either of you watch Scandal. I'm pretty sure if someone's listening to this, they watch Scandal. And of course, the, the scene from the season three premiere where, where Eli is talking to Olivia and he's like, you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Of course, that's like the black parent motto that is like burned into all of our brains. <laughs> That that still applies. Like if you go to these meetups and you're just a student and you've got your car, like you have to show up offering some value, whether it's your conversation, whether it's I'm trying to learn, you know, new things in this field, like do that. And after a while, you'll sort of, I'll say you sort of hone your skills on like, these are people that are good people to talk to. And these are people I should stay away from. Cause I think at first, you think everyone is good until you find out that there are some not so good people out there. And that's just, that's life. Right. But you don't know that unless you go up and start talking to people, interacting with people. And then you sort of can separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always stress to make sure, like make sure that you are one of the good people, like make sure that you're not going out there and, meeting people and just being super critical of, of yeah, yeah. Clients, putting people down. Like, make sure you're really adding to the, the wonderfulness uh, in that culture. Um, and I, I, will give you, I will give you another example of this. This is also at the Adobe event. So, so you're saying, like, you have to be one of those good people. So there was one other person that I remember, but I remember them for not the best reason. Uh, I was sort of going around and sort of introducing myself to people and, you know, finding out where people work. And this, this one guy is like, oh, yeah, um, my name is The Kyle. Like, that was, his, that was on his uh, badge. It was The Kyle. And I'm like, oh, why is it The Kyle? And, you know, and he's like, you should know me. You should know who I am. I didn't know him. I, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> And I'm not saying that because I'm not, no, like, I don't know the Atlanta design field, but I did not know who the hell he was. And I was like, oh, so, like, what have you done and where have you worked? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, you can look me up. You can find me. Because he didn't have a business card or anything like that. And he was saying, you know, I'm doing a little freelancing, and I pick my clients selectively. And if someone wants to find me, they can find me. I'm like, hey, brother, it's a good thing you got a job and you are gainfully employed. That is great. Yeah. Because no. that attitude, that and, I, and I can understand, I mean, I can understand where that comes from, but that. Aside from making you look like a jerk, that doesn't help anybody, really. It really doesn't. Like, you don't want to have that. You don't want people to know that about you. Like, oh, don't talk to the Kyle because he's got, you know, a chip on his shoulder. Like, you don't want you don't want that. You don't want okay. that. So, yeah, definitely make sure that you're one of the good people as well. And if you're not one of the good people, at least don't show it. Like, tuck, that, like, tuck it in, you know? Like, don't. Don't do that. Tuck it in, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're representing all of us. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um, so tell me, as a developer, as a designer, what do you think every designer or what do you think the designers or developers should have in their tech tool set? What are some essentials? In their tech tool set. Yeah. Um, huh, let's see. I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and give a, an unpopular answer, which is going to be Adobe Creative Cloud. And I'm not saying it's like I'm shilling with a company. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are distrustful of, of, uh, of Adobe, one, for moving their software to the cloud because people feel like it's forcing them to upgrade, which it's really not. You can still use your old standalone versions, they don't become automatically defunct. You can still use that. Um, but people don't want to go to go because they feel like it's, it's too much money every month. But I feel like if you're making like at least a hundred dollars a month off of Photoshop, you can give half of that back to, to Adobe. That's, that's the way I feel about it. Um, and I know that there are like some introductory plans. There's like a 99, I'm sorry, there's a $9.99 plan that goes on from now until, I think, October 2nd, where you get uh -huh. Photoshop and Lightroom and 20 gigs of free space and Behance site, the uh, Pro site edition or whatever, for like 10 bucks a month, and like that's the price. 
which you you got ten dollars for Photoshop. You have ten dollars. Like don't don't be that guy. You have ten dollars, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And even if it's like the price where it's like you have thirty dollars, you have fifty dollars. Think about how much money you're making from the tool, and look at that as an investment. Because I mean, if you're if you have a business, you know you can write that off. You know, don't look at like oh, it's money out of your pocket. You can write you can write that off as an expense. Don't necessarily look at it as like money down the toilet. But the reason that I say Adobe uh, Adobe Creative Cloud is good is because of all the integrations that it has with other services that can help make you a more well-rounded designer or developer. Aside from, like, you can have a single app membership, right? But you can just use one tool. But if you get the entire creative suite, that means you have access to all of these different tools for that same price, which is really like a steal. So if I want to get more into print design, I can use InDesign for free. Well, for the price that I'm paying, I can use InDesign. I can use Adobe Audition for uh, for sound editing. I can use After Effects if I want to do motion graphics. So it's that like entire suite of things that you can have to learn from. And of course, there's tons of tutorials out there for like all of this software. So if you're trying to learn something new and like keep learning, and you have an Adobe Creative Cloud membership, it's good because you've got access to industry standard tools that people are using that people look at your resume and say, okay, I'm going to hire you because you know this. Yeah. It's, I think it's good for that. But it also integrates with Typekit, so you have chances to play around with different fonts and typography. Uh, you have automatic syncing with Behance, and Behance is like a – create a portfolio site for designers so you can publish directly from Photoshop into the hand, which is amazing. You don't have to export and crop and resize and upload. You can straight from there, you can do that. It, they give you a free website if you do that. So you have a free Behance profile. You don't have to worry about paying for hosting, paying for a domain. If you want to get a custom domain, you can. They're at GoDaddy, like 99 cents. You can do that. Um, so there's a lot of inherent benefits in there for someone that is trying to continue their learning, whether it's a designer or the developer, because on the development side, you've got uh, Adobe, um, you have Adobe Dreamweaver, of course. You've yeah. got um, Muse, which lets you sort of create websites in sort of a drag-and-drop fashion. Uh, they don't really have anything for, like, hard coding, from what I can tell. Like, if you're doing Ruby or PHP or Python, I'm not 100% sure Creative Cloud could be the best fit for you. Um, but if you're doing more along the lines of web design where you're dealing with HTML and CSS and certainly with design, I think it's a good thing to have in your tech toolbox. Uh, the other thing I would recommend, and this is along the lines of learning, okay. is uh, a subscription to some sort of, uh, uh, I guess, subscription education site. And so there are several of these out there. There's lynda.com, there's treehouse.com, there's uh, General Assembly is a, a kind of a new one that sort of popped up uh, a little bit earlier this year. Uh, there's Code School. So there's, there's a bunch of different, like, subscriptions. Oh, there's Learnable. Learnable's a good one. And with Learnable, you get courses and you get books. I think it's, like, 18 bucks a month, and you get access to their full library of courses and books that you can download on your e-reader, on your iPad, what have you. Um, and the reason for that, again, going along the lines of continued learning is they're constantly putting out new content about new things. And for that, just one price, you can give video lessons, you can learn on your own pace. Uh, I think it's really good for doing stuff like that, just along the lines of, uh, of learning. And I think the last thing, and this is really low tech, because I think everyone has their own setup. Uh, so it's hard to give a specific software thing outside of what I've already mentioned, but uh, just the pencil and paper. I, I think for me, a lot of my best ideas start on the page and they just sort of take off from there because it's, it's just, it's analog. I'm not sitting in front of a screen. There's no barrier of entry for me to get my ideas out the way I want them out there. Yeah. So just a, uh, like a pencil and, and a, I usually have a little like Moleskine notebook and a pen and I'm taking notes everywhere. I also use post-its a lot. You can get like a 12 pack of uh, post-its at Amazon for like 15 bucks. 
and I use them everywhere, everywhere. I've got one in my bag where if I'm thinking about something, I can jot it on a post-it note, I can put it in a notebook, put it on something else. It's good for me if I'm doing storyboarding, if I'm doing flow charts, I can move stuff around, you know, on a wall or something. Like, mm-hmm. pen and paper is always, I think it's always good just to get your ideas out quickly. Um, I've never really been one to do a lot of digital note-taking. I know a lot of people swear by Evernote, swear by OneNote and things like that. And that stuff is great, but like, I have to write it down. For me, I have to write it down or I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to get it. I've got to be able to write it down. So I think that pen and paper is a, it's just a good thing to have around because, you know, you can't get Wi-Fi everywhere. Man, <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited over here. You just have no idea <laughs> because <laughs> I love my notepad and my pencil. And I'm telling you, I, I just... There's nothing that can replace it. You know, there's no wait time. I can. It, it doesn't have a battery. I love Evernote. Right. And I use my iPad for all sorts of things. But my notepad and paper is irreplaceable. And, like, I, like, I tell people, like, make friends with people who write in notepads. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be some of the most creative, kind of, like, quirky people. But it's really, like, about how you can communicate your ideas um, in a variety of ways, whether it's words, whether it's with pictures or whatever, and just on the fly and really kind of let yourself be free. And, and, and that just enables it. So, man, that's – I love your tool set. I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I definitely have to post on that. You know, I, I've, I've actually I've run into people who, who've actually swore off, you know, pen and paper, and they're like, "Why are you using pen and paper? You can just, you know, type it in in, in Notepad, or you can type it in here, or you can type it in there." And, and I use Evernote, um, and but I use it in a different way. I use that more for uh, if I'm, you know doing something on the web and there's a step-by-step some, uh, about something that I want to save and, and look at later or, or, or do again. I'll, you know, they have that, uh, the feature where you can uh, pretty much copy the web page and directly into uh, Evernote now. Uh, and I, and I use it, you know, for stuff like that. Or if I'm, if I'm doing something and I'm taking down, uh, uh, or writing down the steps in which I did, like an install or something like that, uh, and I might want to reproduce it or something. Uh, I might write that down. But when it comes to, you know, jotting down notes about, uh, you know, something that I'm reading about and, and trying to make sense of it, right? Uh, for instance, when I was uh, doing recently learning about putting together like the centralized log uh, logging server, all right, that had these different components. And I wanted to, you know, figure out in my head how all these components fit together and things like that and write out a, a kind of like a, a flow chart on what flows into what. I, I, you know, use a pen and a pad and put it, put it down. Like that's still my, my main uh, tool for, for studying and trying to remember things and, and, you know, trying to be creative with stuff and so yeah i definitely i definitely feel you both on that i i I have all types of notebooks laying everywhere me too i've got i've got probably i'm looking at a stat now that's on one of the shelves of my desk i've got about seven or eight different uh i mean they're full they're full notebooks and it's like the little pocket moleskinas it's the little like thin cayenne moleskinas i've got the regular like five by five, eight by five, big ones like that. I've got a really big, like eight and a half by 11 one that's just graph paper that I use only for writing. So I've got, I probably should get stock in them if they're public. I have a lot of them. So I use them <laughs> all the time, all the time. Nice, I never nice. got a stock in those. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> So, last question before we get uh, get out of here. Um, you mentioned you mentioned earlier one book that you that you felt that everybody or the people who are into develop, development and design should get. Give me give me two more books that you feel should be uh, in in a developer or designer's library. Something that they should definitely read. 
Okay. Um, oh, I feel bad because these are not design books. These are not development books only because, again, like whatever your discipline is that you're going to get into because both design and development are very wide field. It's hard to just say you need to read this book about design or this book about development because I think it's more so about making sure that you get into a particular mindset so you can create whatever you do, whether it's design, whether it's development, what have you. So, um, and of course, I think there's even other books when you're just talking about like business, just business books. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. So other books that I'm I'm thinking of that are, that I've read that have been good. Um, one of them is by Brene Brown. It's a book called uh, The Gift of Imperfection. Uh, it's, I, Oprah, like, I'm sure featured it on her book club or Super Soul Sunday or something. Um, but it's about sort of uh, tapping into your own sort of authenticity and tapping into your own kind of inner well of motivation and embracing whatever your imperfections are and just kind of going forward with that. It's a short book. It's less than 200 pages, so you can probably finish it in like a day or two. Um, but it's not a design book. It's not a development book. It's a book that helps you get out of your own head, essentially. Because it's sort of like what I was saying before about how you have to be prepared to, to kill your work. It sort of sets you up for that level of detachment about the things you do. Like you create great stuff, but don't get too kind of caught up on it, right? Because you have to iterate, you have to become better, that sort of thing. So I think that's one book uh, that's good. Uh, the second book is one that I got. Oh God, when did I get this book? I got this book. When did I get? It was probably. I was think I was working for. I think it's probably around 2004, 2005. I got this book, and it's called uh, Strengths Finder by Tom Rath. I think it's like Strengths Finder 2.0 now. Yeah. Um, and it's it's not. I mean, it's a, it's not a book that you're meant to read the entire way through. It's actually a quiz. It's a quiz that you take. And once you take the quiz, I think you enter it in online or something, it tells you what your top five traits are. And, like, these are your strengths. Because there's this whole thing about, you know, if you're weak on certain things, you have to build up your weaknesses. But what about if you just focus on your strengths, right? Uh Because we all have, like, natural talents that kind of, you know, go untapped and things like that. But what are you, like, really good at? Like, focus on what you're really good at and get a lot better at it, essentially. So Strength Finder, for me, helps identify the things that I'm best at. So that then lets me know, well, these are things that I need to focus on the most. And if there are things that fall outside of that, I can find a way to use my strengths to make up for that, whether it's outsourcing it or if it's, you know, whatever. So, like, for me, for example, I think my strengths were – Oh, crap. I don't remember my strength. It was, oh, man. It was achievement, individualization, learning, strategic, and something that starts with an F. Because it's funny because it spells out fails, like F-A-I-L-S. But these are my strengths. And so for me, moving forward from there, it's like, okay, I know I'm a strategic person, so I need to focus on things that hone my strategy. I know that I'm focused on learning. So I need to find different ways to learn things and other outlets that I can learn, stuff like that. Um, I think that's good just so you know what your strengths are in general, but also going into any project, going into anything where you have to collaborate with someone else. If you're able to say, this is what I know and this is what I don't know, it's a lot better than you saying, I know everything, and then it turns out you don't really know that much. Uh, there was one interview that, that we did. It was the 25th interview, and it was with uh, Brandon Butler, who's the director of techno- or technical director at Edelman Digital. And he was saying, you know, when we look for people that, you know, we want to bring on our team or just in general, we're looking for someone that is coachable. Like we're looking for someone that can be taught something, right? Yeah. So you know already, well, these are the things that I'm strong at. These are the things that I'm good at. But in the same vein, you also know the things that you're not good at, but these are the things that you can be taught in, right? Mm-hmm. So you have that knowledge kind of already there. 
So I think that helps in, in terms of, of uh, is it a collaborative project that you do because you're, unless you're just a designer or a developer on an island, eventually you're going to be working for a company, you're going to be working for a team, you're going to be working with people in general, and you have to learn how to use your strengths to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, whether or not that sort of taps into you being a better designer or a developer, I think, lies within, but it's important to make sure that you've got that sort of emotional center to know these are the things that I'm the best at. These are the things that I'm good at. So I'm, these are ways that I can apply my strength in this particular project. Yeah, I like that. Excellent. I actually like Strength Finders too. Um, yeah, I took the I I took it actually with the company that I work with uh, uh, a couple of years back, and it was really insightful for me at a stage where I was kind of trying to figure out what my next step would be and really kind of seeing the areas that um, that I'm really strong at and seeing the areas that I'm weak at um, really did help me in a lot of ways. So I think that's, I think all your, your suggestions are really good. I just remember what my F was. It was futuristic. That's what it was. <laughs> it was futuristic, uh, achiever, individualization, learner, strategic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what they were. So that's so like for me that I know that when I go into other projects or if I'm doing other things, I know that I'm always someone that's looking forward mm-hmm. to what things can be. I'm someone that is always trying to continuously improve what I'm doing. I'm someone that looks at alternate ways to proceed to different things. Um, you know, so like stuff like that for me is important just to know what next steps I need to take and. I think that just helps with people in general, you're a designer or a developer. It just helps you get in that mindset. And then once you're in that mindset, you'll yeah. kind of know and gravitate towards the things that you know that can help you based on what your strengths are. So that's why I can't really say like, oh, you need to read, learn the program because it'll teach you how to program. It might not teach you how to program, you know, because everyone yeah. has different learning styles. Some people are more kinesthetic. Some people are more visual. Like it's, it's it's just different, right? So it's it's hard to give like a specific book recommendation. If you're talking about business stuff, I can give you business book recommendations because I have some experience with that. But just in general with design and development, like uh, it's important to sort of read books that get you in a particular mindset so you know who you are as a person. Um, and from there, that's when you can sort of, learn to let go of things, let go of your design, let go of your development, and use that to focus and, and go further. Mm. So what I'm hearing is that you are a designer, and it's within you, and you just need to get out and get the, get the exposure to help what's inside of you come out. I mean, I think, I think everyone is a designer in some aspects, whether they, whether they say they are or not. Like, a designer is not necessarily someone that, has to know how to draw. A designer isn't someone that has to be like particularly artistic with painting or something like that. I think everyone has that capacity to be a designer uh, yeah. in some shape, form, or fashion. Yeah, I love it. Love it. So, Maurice, before we before we get out of here, uh, for people that's listening, uh, tell them how they can contact you or how to follow you or, you know, uh, your, your, your URLs to your sites? Okay. Well, I have, uh, there's actually a lot of ways. <laughs> a, there's a lot of ways to reach me. Um, and not to sound like braggy, but if you just type in my name into Google, Maurice Cherry, and you click I'm Feeling Lucky, there's a probably a pretty good chance you'll have, wind up on my site. Like my site might be the first the first search result or something. Um, okay. So there's my site, there's mauricecherry.com. You can contact me through there. I'm on Twitter as Maurice Cherry. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Maurice Cherry. Uh, what else? There's Revision Path, of course. So revisionpath.com. We're also Revision Path on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I'm thinking of going and branching out the Tumblr, but I'm not 100% sure about that just yet. That might be a, a 2014 thing, but thinking about it. Um, And then there's my business, which is 318 Media. That's the number three, the word 18, 3-E-I-G-H-T-E-E-N, media.com. We're also 
on Facebook and Twitter as 318 Media and on Behance as 318 Media, uh, although it's about a year old, so we've got new <laughs> stuff. I just haven't put it up yet. Uh, but that's, the, yeah, those are the places you can you can find me. I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. I'm really pretty easy to get in touch with, despite popular opinion, because some people are like, oh, you can never reach us. I'm pretty popular. It might take me a while to get back to you, but you will reach me. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. Marius, I definitely appreciate, we definitely appreciate uh, you coming uh, on a podcast and uh, telling us about, you know, uh, the things that you're working on, telling us about your background and giving us a very, very in, uh, informative and insightful uh, podcast. I think one of the, the most informative that we've had in, in quite a while. And then uh, definitely appreciate that. Well, thank you. It was Certainly my pleasure to be here. Thank both of you again for not just having me on the, on the show to interview. That's great. But just this whole entire platform is, is amazing. You were talking earlier about how you had, I think it was over a thousand people. You got over a thousand yeah. or 1200 people in your community. Like that is amazing. That is great. And the more of us that, cause there's, you know, there's more of us that are out doing this, but the more that we work together, and we sort of come together sort of like soul food, like, you know, that family, like we got to be that this. Like the more of us that kind of come together and, and work on this, this problem, really this problem of, of diversity or showing the diversity, I should say, showing the diversity that's in this industry, the more of us that come together and work on that, the better for, for everyone, not just for us that are currently in it, but especially for people that are coming up that need to see, they need to see people that look like them in these positions to know that this is something that they can strive for. So thank you. No, I know no, our, our pleasure, our pleasure. And thanks for leaving us with that, that, uh, that last bit of information there. Thanks. And we definitely Go ahead, have, have you back, uh, Maurice. If you will, if you will have us, we will have you back. So <laughs> <laughs> you can have me back anytime. Just, just, uh, just let me know. I thought it was, I'm not hard to reach. Just let me know. Great. Great, great. And just just uh, a last bit of um, what I want to put out there is there's actually somebody on. Just turn somebody onto your website. They're, 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 I think they're, they're a, a UIUX designer um, out of San Diego, and uh, they just follow Blacks and Technology. And I was like, hey, you need to check out Revision Path. Uh, and they just added it to uh, them to, uh, I guess they. Oh, nice. Added, yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. yeah. So yeah, we, we've know. got we've got interviews. I can tell you now we've got uh, we got interviews going. At least right now, I've got interviews scheduled to go out through early March. So I'm probably not going to oh, start right. looking for more people to interview until probably around early February. Definitely, yeah. I, and I'm not saying this to dissuade anyone, but I'm definitely looking for more. Uh, women to interview because the next few months are kind of a sausage fest, but I'm looking for more women <laughs> to interview definitely. Cause we, I mean, because a lot of people say, you know, we think it's really good that Revision Path is also focusing on, on highlighting black women in this field, which I think is very important. Uh, but then I was looking at the calendar, I was like, well, the next three months is like mostly dudes. Um, <laughs> so I, I I definitely want to make I'm putting that invitation out there. If there are black women that are web developers, that are graphic designers, that are web designers, you know, reach out to me. I've got a list of people that I need to reach out to on my own, but I'm probably, like I said, not going to get to that for a few months now. But we got some good interviews in December, including uh, a discount code. I think it's like right around second week of December, so for people that are doing their Christmas shopping, they can check that out. We've got some great interviews in January. I'm not going to spoil it, but we got some great, great interviews in January. And then we got some good ones in February, too. So Excellent. Check us out. Check us out. Yeah, I appreciate it. Maurice Sher, everybody. Thanks a lot, Maurice. And uh, like uh, you already said, we'll definitely have you back on here in the future. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I had a good time. Great. Take care. Blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. 
Blacks in technology. Blacks in technology.